Revenge. You've heard about it, we've got stories about it on Reddit. Today we're going to be covering r slash revenge. Now sit back, shut up, chuck a prawn on the barbie, and enjoy some bloody good content. Thanks. Posted by user ScarletAbsol13. Titled, Steal My Wallet? Enjoy getting caught literally red-handed and losing your job. So I work at a supermarket, and for a while a few years back, stuff would get stolen out of people's bags in the break room. It was mostly cash, phone charges, headphones, little things like that. We did have little lockers in the break room, but they're maybe 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, or one foot by one foot, and too small to hold anything larger than a medium-sized purse. So if someone had a larger bag or even a large puppy jacket, it wouldn't fit. I usually carry a messenger bag big enough to fit a notebook or sketchbook in it. I like to draw or write while on break, which was too big to stick in one of the lockers without having it get stuck, and I usually stashed it under a coat rack. I hardly ever keep money or anything more valuable than a mechanical pen in my bag while at work. I keep any money or my debit card on me at all times, except for one particular day. Before work one particular Sunday, I had to go buy a new television since mine had suddenly stopped working the night before. I must have forgotten to take my wallet out of my bag before heading to work, because the following day, I discovered that it was missing. However, whoever took it only took the wallet because my debit card, college ID, and MBTA, Boston Subway System, fare card, had been thrown in my bag. The wallet in question was a small coach brand wallet, so I can see why they took it, but I had only spent about 14 bucks on it since I got it at a coach outlet store, so it wasn't like I spent a lot on it. As annoying as it was to have my television die in the middle of playing an online video game, thankfully on the Switch, so I could at least finish the match that I was in, because I had to buy a new television, I had spent the $150 cash that I had been keeping in my wallet up until that point. After meeting with the management and our loss prevention guy, LP for short, the consensus was basically, we're sorry that happened to you, but there's nothing we can do about it. Keep your stuff locked up from now on. Which I did. I started locking my bag to the coat rack with a bike lock. The market I work at is union, so management isn't allowed to put cameras in the break room. So I talked to our LP guy about it a little more, and asked him if I would get in trouble if I were to put a prank wallet filled with glitter and powdered food coloring in my bag. And he said, not at all. I also went to the union steward about it, and he also said that I wouldn't get in trouble, but also told me to be careful. So I put my plan into motion. I bought a fake coach wallet that cost more than that one that had been stolen, go figure some edible glitter, and powdered red food colouring. I sewed a strip of elastic into the opening of the wallet. The wallet had a zippered pocket for money and cards, then stuffed it with as much of the glitter and food colouring powder as I could, so that when the wallet was opened, all the glitter and food colouring would pop out all over the hands of the person who opened it. I then planted it in my bag and waited. I didn't have to wait very long. A few weeks later, I heard from our LP guy that a cashier had been going through people's bags again and fell for my glitter bomb wallets, hook, line, and sinker. Tried to then wash the glitter off her hands, which activated the powdered red food coloring. She then freaked out when it stained her hands bright red and went to management about it. She wanted the person who planted the wallet to get in trouble for it, but since it had been with another worker's personal belongings, and the wallet wasn't harmful or illegal, there was nothing they could do to the worker who did it. The girl ended up getting fired for openly admitting to going through people's bags for money and other valuables, and ended up throwing two other cashiers under the bus for stealing from people as well. They were fired shortly after. I did get spoken to by management after the fact, since they knew that I had planted the wallet in my bag, but the discussion was more or less, we know the wallet was yours, we didn't tell the person who tried taking it that it was yours, and we're not going to tell you that you can't do that again. Our next post is by user Internal Researcher 8 titled, Park in Two Spaces? Enjoy waiting to get back in your car. 
so I went out to eat at a local fast food place before going to work. When I arrived, the parking lot was full except for one space, but some inconsiderate buffoon had parked across the line. I wasn't about to make myself late waiting for another space to open up. Thankfully, there was enough room for me to pull into this last space, which was next to the driver's door of the other car. My driver's door was next to the curb, so I had no trouble getting out. While I was inside waiting for my food, I'd already ordered, a woman came inside upset that someone had parked blocking her in. The management went outside with her to look. While they were out there, my order was cold, so I took my food and sat down to eat. My table was right next to the door. They came in, I heard the manager tell her that there was nothing he could do because the other car is clearly parked in a single space, and she proceeded to go table to table, asking whose car that was because she needed to leave. For some odd reason, she never stopped at my table. After asking at a few tables, she gave up and went outside and sat on the front of her car. After I finished my meal, I walked out, got in my car. As I was walking to my car, I heard her on the phone, talking presumably to her boss and telling him that she was going to be late. I just drove away without even acknowledging her. Edit. A common question in the comments was, why didn't she just get in the passenger side and slide over? 1. Very large woman. 2. Compact car. 3. As I walked past her car, I saw that it was rather full of clutter so no room to even get in the passenger side, let alone move across. And our next post is by user TheCuntHunter6969, titled, Unwilling to pay? Let them eat semen cake, ew. So I'm a 17 year old web dev who can make basic websites and stuff to earn money for video games. The job's pretty easy for the pay. I get picked up by some local bakery so people could pre-order cakes and stuff online. I took a few hours to puke out a functional backend and a day to make it all pretty. Thanks, Bootstrap. I had agreed for RS700, basically 10 bucks, which is insanely cheap even for India. But all I need is video game money, so I'm good with that. When I'm done with the job, they needed to purchase the domains and a server, which I explicitly told them. You pay me 10, and I use another 10 to buy a domain and five to rent servers. They give me 15 so I could set their stuff up. Once the website was fully operational, I asked for my money, but apparently they didn't want to pay because if I wasn't hosting the server anyways, why do I need compensation? You know, because apparently time has no value. The thing was, I could still access the server, as I had the credentials for the server. So I go home, log in, and make one tiny change. The way the website works is that there's a customer page which shows you your orders, and there's a page for the store owners to see orders, payments, etc. Here is what I did. I added a small inconspicuous, may contain semen warning in all product details. In the page where it shows your order confirmations to the customer, some options are changed with semen. So like semen frosting, by random. The website went down in about a week, and they're back selling on Facebook lol. Guessing someone complained or something. Our next post is by user Chicken Fashion Show, titled, I did to my neighbor what they did to others. To start, I bought a house with the intention of doing a flip. When I moved in, the self-appointed block captain let me know who they were the first day. Sadly, they were my next door neighbors. I tried to be friendly, but listening to them, I realized how horrible they were and tried to still be civil. My significant other kept saying, just wait for it to be our turn. They bragged about, through their contracts with the city, forcing people to make improvements on their houses, getting undesirable renters out of the houses, and just harassing people in general. As I worked on flipping my house, the wife became a worse thorn in my side. To start, she demanded I put up a fence so people would quit cutting through my yard and scaring her. Then, 
Her and the husband demanded I take care of the weeds in the yard, or they will do it and bill me. After a storm, a tree scraped their shingles and they asked for $1,200 to replace them. The tree was there before I moved in, and by co-ed, they are responsible to cut back the branches to the property line. When I wouldn't pay, they had a relative jump my fence and cut the trees down. Did someone say tree law? Dude, you could get like treble damages for that. That's crazy. God, these people don't know what they're doing cutting your trees down like that. That's going to cost them like $120,000, dude. Treble damages. Are you in a treble damage state? That's crazy. Anyway, needless to say, I began to ignore them. So she became a constant gnat and moved on to another target. Then one day, as I was tearing down my deck for a patio, I realized she put a feral cat colony on a section of my property. I had wondered why all the stray cats were around, and I finally found out. I reached out to the city and demanded it be removed, but they said she followed the law on getting it in place. As I tried to get it shut down, she began unhinged behavior, from standing in her windows staring at me, yelling out the window at me, to hitting the fence with items to scare my dog. Here, my revenge started. I started by filing a HRO slash harassment restraining order against the wife and had it granted ex part with the evidence I provided. Of course, she contested as it was defamatory to her character. Before the hearing, the husband tried to physically intimidate me. So I filed one against him and it was also granted ex part. In the hearing, it came up that there was an HRO against the husband as well. They dogged being served until I had it published as a means of service. I started to make complaints about them and their house. Also, I made police calls when necessary. As I did this, the other neighbors began to realize they could do to them what they had done to them and others. For example, as I was having my front door replaced, needing a building work permit, I knew they were doing internal remodeling. So I called a city inspector, and they were fined for not having a permit. As she ranted at the inspector, he looked at my window and saw that I had mine displayed. Their back porch became hoarded, so I made another call to a city inspector, and they had to clear it out. Then they had a broken window on the porch door, so I called an inspector, and they had to replace the door. Next, the paint on their house was peeling, so I called an inspector, and they had to repaint. The inspector also found the wood underneath was rotted along with their front porch was sloping. So, they needed to fix the front porch, sections of wood, and repaint. Through all this, they had up cameras to prove that they were not doing the things I said, i.e. hitting the fence. They also pointed a camera at my backyard. As it was legal to point a camera into my yard, and as part of my HRO was her intrusive watching behaviours, I gave the camera the middle finger on the way to and from my garage. When she complained, with the city tiring of her, their response was that she was admitting to intrusively watching me. The fight over the cat colony came to an end when I realised one of the cats had a serious disease, and I began to capture them and turn them into animal control. Don't worry, animal control was part of the feral cat program, so they would not be put down, but the neighbor would have to pay a fine to get each cat out or have the colony closed. Finally, I caught the sick one and it had rabies. Part of the program was for her to capture each new cat and have it vaccinated. Something she admitted to willingly not doing on her GoFundMe for the colony. I soon had the GoFundMe shut down when I provided the evidence that she was not using the funds as she stated they were going to be used. The city now had to act to close the colony, the person at animal control who wouldn't respond to my complaints was fired. The neighbours called in a city mediator who we met with and presented all the evidence and said we would not meet with them and provided extremely racist tweets they made about neighbours. The city cut ties with them as community leaders. With their power to bully gone, and having spent what I can only imagine in fines and repairs like they did to other neighbours, after 14 years, they sold their house and moved out, way out to the suburbs where they only have one neighbour about 50 yards away. 
They knew I was wrapping up my flip and would be out in less than a year. Without being able to bully their neighbors, with people having their back, they seemed to have no further reason to stay. Needless to say, I did several more things to wear them down. Finally, when I listed my house, it was sold while theirs was still on the market. As a final F.U. to them, I reported to the county that they had both the new house and old house listed as their homestead, meaning they were paying less in property taxes, so they got hit with more fines on my way out. Marshall Mello says, You flipped the house, you flipped them off, and you flipped the tables on them. What didn't you flip? LL Cool L Jesse says, Cut down your trees? Where are all the amateur tree lawyers at? I know, right? That's a lot of money you could have gotten. It's treason then. And our last post today is by Yuzika, Metallica Can't Die 2. <laughs> There's two of them. Titled, Neighbor Likes to Park in Front of My House? Okay then. So this happened a few years ago. My neighbor started parking on the street behind my car, like literally inches, for no apparent reason. My neighbor has a driveway, which is empty, and also lived two houses down the street. I don't have a driveway, so on-street parking is a must for me. So, after a few weeks, I asked if it was necessary to park so close when there was literally no cars on the street for over a quarter of a mile. He said no, but there's no law against it, with a big shit-eating grin on his face. A few weeks pass by, and my car gets hit because someone thought there was enough room to clear as his truck blocked the view of my car entirely. I see this happen, but unfortunately, can't get a model or license plate number. I find my neighbor's email address, because I didn't really feel like talking to him, and asked him again if he could just park further down the road, closer to his house. He replied, nope, suck on it. Okay. I had lived there for quite a long time and never had any issues with him or any other neighbor. I keep to myself, never make noise, don't have any noisy pets or parties, etc. His truck has his business name on it. I google it and find out it's his own business. Lots of Yelp reviews, triple B rating, etc. All these links point to his website. I go to check out his website and it doesn't load up. I head over to who is and see that the domain isn't even registered. I snag it. Before I think of what to do with it, I googled the owner's name and find out he's been convicted of murdering a child 20-ish years ago. I find a handful of links that details his story rather explicitly. I copy slash paste all those links into an email to him a throwaway account so he can't just reply to me as I deleted it afterward. Said something like, Well, if you want to be a jerk for no reason, I just bought your business domain. Here is all the links I plan on posting on it. I don't have to list your business name because all of your business listings across the internet have this URL pointing to it. Keep parking like a jerk. Yes, it's legal, but you are willingly doing this just to annoy me. I legally bought your domain and can legally link these articles. Park behind me again and I'll launch it. Within an hour, his truck was moved onto his property. He asked me for the domain and I told him, when either you move or I move, I will hand it over. Until then, it will remain offline. And edit, only thing fake was the time frame. This happened last week not a few years ago. He was originally charged with capital murder, but his lawyer convinced him of a plea deal for manslaughter because they have way more than enough to convict you of capital murder. Edit 2. For those saying this is fake, I'm putting my house on the market in two to three months. When it sells, I'll come back and post all the news articles, as I won't be anywhere near here, so doxing will be much more difficult. Well, if any of you guys want to keep up with that, go check out their username and follow their profile on Reddit. If you want to see this very real thing in two to three months, you are more than welcome to. Posted by user anonymousannie5523. Titled, I help someone get revenge on their gold digging ass of a significant other. 
This happened some years ago, but I was just reminded of it, so here you go Reddit. I worked as a front desk agent in a large luxury hotel chain for some years. One particular hotel I worked at was located really close to the downtown area, and so we got a large number of young, very wealthy business people who loved to party. I usually worked the second and third shifts, which meant I got to see loads of drunken hookups, breakups, cheating, hookers, and more. This particular one though, this is one I will never forget. I was working at the desk when a group of young, well-dressed men come walking in. They've all clearly been drinking, but aren't so drunk that they can't walk right and hold a conversation. One of them comes up to me and tells me that while he and his friends were at the bar, a woman was hitting on him, and even though he told her no multiple times, she wouldn't stop. So he and his friends left, and it wasn't until they got in the Uber that he realized he didn't have his room key anymore. He thinks she took it, and he's concerned that she may come up to his room. He asked that I deactivate his keys, and if she does come up to the hotel, to not let her in. When he was telling me all of this, it didn't sit right with me. He and his friends were all grinning about it and snickering amongst one another. Then he gave a clear description of her, without being asked. Told me height, body shape, hair color, and style. The kind of dress she was wearing all while saying it in a mocking tone. Now, this could have easily been because he thought the whole thing was ridiculous, or was too drunk to take it seriously, but it really didn't sound right to me. Either way, I did as I was trained in that situation. I pulled up his reservation, deactivated the keys as requested, made him a new set when he showed me his ID, and even offered to move him to a new room if that would make him feel more comfortable. He and his buddies all laughed a little at that, and he declined, took the keys, and they went to their room. About an hour or so later, the woman he described showed up. Now, by this point, my relief for the night had also shown up, and was sitting at the front desk while I was in the back office, counting down my cash drawer. I hadn't had a chance to tell him about the woman. Just as I'm walking out of the back office with my bag and about to leave, I see my co-worker buzz the doors open, and the woman comes rushing in, cuts through the lobby and down the hall to the elevators. She was barefoot, holding her heels in her hands, and knew exactly where she was going. I rushed up to him and told him that the man from before had told about her. My co-worker looked at me confused. He then pointed to the screen that had the reservation pulled up and told me that when the woman arrived, she went to use the room keys and they didn't work. So he asked for her room number and last name. She gave both and her name is on the reservation. I looked at the reservation and down in the notes, there was a woman's name listed. The man from before was listed as the primary, but her name was listed as a secondary with his consent to be in the room. I was confused. I thought maybe she wasn't the same woman that he was talking about, but to be on the safe side, I called the man in his room and told him the situation and that we allowed a woman, fitting that description he gave, to enter the building because she confirmed her name was on the room. He laughed, said he forgot her name was on the room, and asked that I remove it. I was now super confused. I asked to make sure. I said, sir, just to be clear, the woman you met at the bar tonight was with you at check-in hours ago and was allowed keys then, but now she's not? He laughs to all his friends in the room and says, Ha oh, guys, I confused the poor girl. He gets back on the phone with me and he says, Yeah, sweetheart, she's banned from the room. Don't worry about the other details, just take a name off. I say, hmm, I see. Then, if she isn't going to be on the room anymore, would you like us to call the police and have her removed from the property? He's like, <laughs> whoa, 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 that is too far there. Don't worry, she'll get the hint soon enough. We ended the call there and I got really suspicious of this. I told my co-worker to not do anything and that I was going to stick around for a bit to see if anything happened. A short time later, the woman came off the elevator, pouring tears, sobbing while on the phone with someone. She sat down in our lobby, and my co-worker and I tried to look busy while eavesdropping hard on her phone call. She was sobbing on the phone to her mum and sister. 
From what she told them, she was invited out to spend the week with her boyfriend, meeting all of his college buddies. This being their first night, they had all met up for dinner and drinks. After a bit, she went to the restroom and when she came back, she caught her boyfriend hitting on another woman. His friends all bet that he wouldn't do it. When she confronted him ticked off, he called her a bunch of names and humiliated her in front of his friends and the entire bar. All of his friends joined in on the mocking her, and he threw in her face that she was nothing without him, and dumped her right there. He and his friends then took an Uber back and left her stranded at the bar with no money and no way back. She then had to use her phone's GPS to walk back to the hotel from the bar, barefoot. She had heels, and walking two miles in those was not going to cut it. She was asking her mom and sister for help, as he wouldn't let her in the room to get her luggage or her wallet. My heart broke. I felt horrible. I helped this guy treat this poor woman like crap, and now all he and his friends were up there laughing at her while she's sitting in our lobby sobbing, and with nothing. I went over to our snacks area in the lobby. I grabbed her a bottle of water and brought it to her. I told her that I couldn't help but overhear the conversation and was very sorry for her situation, and asked if she would like us to help. I informed her that if he was keeping her from getting her things, we could call the police and have them force him to hand over her things so that she could leave if she would like. Or, if she wanted to let her mom or sister pay for a room, we would be very happy to give her a very low rate in a room far from him. She thanked me, took the water, and tried to calm down and talk to me about what was all happening, and what her options were. Eventually, we decided on her staying in the hotel for the night and figuring out the rest in the morning. As we make it to the desk, she asks me to try and run her credit card to see if it has enough on it for another room. I asked her what she means by another room, and she tells me that she's actually paying for the room he's in, that his name is on the room because he booked it, but it's her card paying for everything. This intrigued me. I asked why she was paying for the room if it was in his name. She told me that she's the one with a job, not him, that he hasn't been able to find a job in his field since graduating from college and is essentially living off of his parents' money. But just after they started dating, his parents cut him off, so he's been living off of her money. That's why she was so upset and confused by how he had been acting all night. He was sweet and doing everything for her back home, but since he met up with his friends, he did a 180 and hasn't been the same guy the entire time. I wanted to tell her that it was obvious that he was using her for the money and that he probably would blame his friends for all of this and then try to get back with her later on but I doubted that she would have listened to me or cared for a complete stranger to butt in on her personal life like that. So, instead, I offered up a sweet piece of revenge. I informed her that, considering that she's the one paying for the room, if she can confirm that it's her card on file with some sort of photo ID and verify the last four digits of the card number, that's honestly all this hotel company required, then she could, if she wanted to, kick him out of the room and keep it all to herself. But, considering how poorly her night has been, if she were indeed able to prove that she is the one paying for the room, then I'd be more than happy to provide her the biggest luxury upgrade we offered at our property. Largest suite we had, full hotel amenity access, I would even have my co-worker fish out a bottle of champagne and some fresh strawberries for her to have her sent to her room all free of charge. She was taken aback by the offer and was very sincerely tempted. She looked like she was about to say no. Then I told her that since she would be upgrading her room, that would require moving her things from that room into her new one, which meant the room that she's currently listed in would need to be vacated immediately. If anyone were to remain in the room after we had demanded it be vacated, we are required to have them escorted off the property or they pay for the room. Their choice. She then thought about it, pulled up her card's banking app and showed me the screen. It had a photo of her, her full name, the card's full number, and the hold from our hotel for the room. She asked if that worked. Huh, it was good enough for me. So I quickly upgraded her. 
moved everything over in the system, and before I could say a word to my coworker, he was already grabbing a set of master keys, a bell cart, and was asking her what her luggage looked like, since he would be the one retrieving it for her to deliver to her room. He didn't want her to have to deal with her ex again. She smiled and told him which ones were hers, and that she hadn't unpacked yet. My coworker runs down to the elevators and up to fetch her things. All the while, I make her a new set of keys and send her off to her new room. Once she's on the elevator, my phone at the desk starts ringing. It's the ex-boyfriend, and he is very angry about why my coworker has entered the room and is taking her things. I calmly explain that I cannot give out the private information of any of our guests, and that if he would like to remain in his room, he will need to pay for it, as there is no longer a method of payment on his room. He blew up. He's making a ton of demands, and at the same time yelling at my coworker to stop what he's doing. But it's obvious from the way he's yelling at him that my coworker isn't listening to him. I can even hear the guy's friends telling him to chill out and just pay for the damn room. I then explain that we will give him a courtesy 10 minutes to make a decision, at which point, if he doesn't have payment ready, then he must vacate the building or we will be forced to call the authorities and have him evicted. He continues to yell at me, he screams, swears, threatens, and yells for a solid minute before taking a breath. I then tell him he has nine minutes remaining, and asks if he has come to a decision yet. He hangs up on me. Nine minutes later, I call the room and he doesn't answer. I call again. No answer. I call a third time. He picks up, then immediately hangs up. I call the police, and I tell them what's going on, and they said that they're on their way. The officers arrive. I tell them what's going on. We go up to the room together, and the man and his friends are all white as ghosts when they see the cops. The cops explain to the ex-boyfriend and his friends that they are being evicted. The ex-boyfriend starts trying to talk to me, but the cops stop him and tell him to only talk to them. I told them about his attitude on the phone before. The friends are all offering to pay for the room at this point, and the cops look at me and ask if that would be acceptable. I smile very sweetly and say, no. And the cops nod and start rushing all of the guys to grab their things and leave the room. The ex-boyfriend is the last one out of the door, carrying his two bags and complaining that he isn't even given a luggage cart and has to carry his own things. Aw, boo-hoo. His friends all looked pissed at him. I go with the officers to escort all of them out of the building and I run into my co-worker in the lobby. He waits until they're all outside in the parking lot to tell me that the woman is in her new room, loves it, and said no to the champagne. She just wanted to sleep. I didn't get to see her before she left town the next day, but the ex-boyfriend did try calling our hotel to complain a number of times, and even tried leaving some bad reviews of us online and lied through all of it. I hope she doesn't have to ever deal with him again. Edit... Just wanted to address some things that you guys brought up in the comments. 1. I have no idea why she didn't use Uber instead of walking. Probably due to the distress of the moment and didn't think of it. Honestly, if you're ever in that situation, despite being publicly humiliated like that, ask the staff for help. Either they think of something you're too panicked to think of, or they'll be nice and pay for an Uber for you. I've done it for people plenty when working in hotels. There is no shame in asking for help. And two, the credit card company is Capital One. I wasn't going to mention it since some subs immediately flag your story for listing major company names, and I didn't want to fuss with that. But yeah, their app lets you post a picture on your profile, and on most banking and credit card apps, you are able to pull up the full card number by clicking on the account information. Yes, Technically, I shouldn't have accepted this as a form of ID. However, given how crap her night was, I didn't care. And our next post was by user Von Adler, titled, Fired? Are you sure? Okay. Note 1, this story was told to me by a friend and is about her father. 
I won't be able to answer many follow-up questions. It takes place at around 2005. I believe the story to be true, but I can't verify it, of course. And note too, this happens in Sweden, where there's no at-will employment. Once an employee is past the initial six-month probation period, you can't fire them without a cause, which also requires an established paper trail. And note three, I am not a native English speaker, and professional terms may be wrong. I am happy to take any corrections. So, my friend's father, since retired, was a mechanical engineer. He was around 55 when this happened, and very experienced in his fields. In fact, he had some skill sets that were close to unique to the extent that you might be able to replicate them, but at extreme costs. We are talking multiple people from multiple companies from multiple countries, taking weeks, if not months, to get up to speed with specific projects to do the same thing. He was also a no bullcrap kind of guy who did his job, did it well, but also pointed out problems and expected others to point out problems to him. He was extremely solution-oriented and had no time for office politics or keeping a positive attitude at work. Basically, your everyday grumpy old engineer who really knew his thing and was always ready to help you if asked, but not very forthcoming in team building exercises and so on. He also ran his own business on the side, doing minor projects and so on. As was required by his employer, he had reported this and was sure to not cause any conflicts and interests, so his employer knew and accepted this. He was considered a valuable employee and got several awards that he cared little for, but anyway, during his many years with this employer. By all accounts, they paid him well, respected his knowledge and accommodated his style, and he returned the favor by working very hard and making sure to mentor younger and newly employed engineers to make them effective co-workers. Then his firm was acquired by a larger firm, and a new management team installed. Initially, everyone was promised that things would remain the same, but with the new management came a new office culture. The new management pressured for unpaid overtime, for a more American corporate culture, with cheering and clapping and so on and so forth. He considered it extremely cringe and refused to participate. His status as a long-standing and knowledgeable employee kept him safe for some time, before the new management realized that resistance to the new culture centered around him and started pressuring him to play along. When he did not, they turned increasingly hostile, realizing that he held a lot of soft power in the company, having mentored a large percentage of the engineers and resistance to their leadership centering around him. They started ordering him to work overtime. He answered that he was on time with his projects and that if they had identified an emergency requiring overtime, they would have to bring it up with the union to negotiate the overtime and make sure that it was an actual emergency. The contract with the union said no overtime unless in an emergency. They tried to force him to participate in the cheering and clapping by making it mandatory for him to attend and yelling at him to participate. And he did but so unenthusiastically that the event turned even more cringe and people started laughing. The workday turned more and more hostile, and he knew that things would come to a head sooner or later. Being an experienced engineer and knowing how to document things, he always had his ducks in a row. Then it finally happened. They caught him answering an email for his side business on his work laptop brought him in and fired him on the spot for theft of company resources. He sat at the conference table and looked at the three managers in the eyes, one after the other, and asked, Are you sure you want to do this? They all said yes. Are you really sure you want to do this? He was escorted to his desk by security to leave his phone, his badge, and his computer at the desk, and then escorted out. Once out of the building, he phoned his union representative, who immediately cancelled the firing, claiming there was no just cause, which meant that it would go to the labor board for arbitration. You see, the company had an IT policy that it was okay to use the company laptop for personal business, including a side business, 
as long as you were on a break in compliance with IT security protocols and the company was aware of and had approved his side business. And he was on break. Of course, he had his declaration of a side business, signed by his former manager, and the IT policy available and sent both to the union representative. Then he called his lawyer and asked him to send the pre-prepared cease and desist on two patents he held. Patents that were not that significant, and nothing he could make any serious money out of, since they were mostly for very specific things used by the solutions he designed and used at his employers, but still his that he had brought with him into the employment and allowed the employer to use in exchange for a slightly higher pay, which of course was all duly documented in his contract. Then he went home for some vacation and tending his side business. He was always a man to prepare, and had enough money saved up to last him for a good time, to the extent that he considered retiring entirely. My friend said that he had two job offers from competitors that had looked to sniping him for some time within the week, basically as soon as they learned that he was available. He was gracious, but declined, but offered them to consult with his side business now that he had the time, which they eagerly accepted, at twice the hourly rate he had made at his earlier employers. His colleagues started ringing the day after for advice, since the projects he had managed could not go on without him. He was perfectly polite, but denied any information and help, saying that he had left everything he had had with management and to contact them, as he was no longer employed there. Several clients that phoned his private number were told the same thing. Since his private number was not on a public registry, he suspected that both colleagues and clients spent some time and or money to find it. It took two weeks before a manager phoned him and asked him things. He politely declined to answer, got yelled at, and replied with something like, I'm sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone who works for you, and hung up. This happened a few times, and the next week HR phoned him and stated the firing had been a mistake and he was welcome back to his job. He again politely declined, saying that he awaited the Labor Board's decision, but until then, he was happy to consult for them, at six times his hourly pay, after taxes and administrative costs, of course. After a few days of wrangling and trying to negotiate, they had to accept, and then he sprung the patent issue on them, forcing them to pay for those too. Less than two and a half weeks after being fired, he was back at his desk. After roughly three months, the firing came to the labor board. The employer stated that they believed they had handled the issue correctly, but they were still willing to offer my friend's father his position back, in the interest of goodwill and reconciliation. My friend's father and the union simply stated that he was now employed elsewhere, his own company, and was no longer available. The labor board ruled in my friend's father's and the union's favor, and he got the normal damages, three months pay damage and 20 months pay severance package, including pension and of course the lawyer costs of the union paid by the employer. According to my friend, her father continued to work there until he retired, working 20 hours or so per week and 10 to 15 hours for other companies, making a pretty penny, continuing to charge them three times what he charged their competitors as an asshole tax. The managers were not fired, but they were moved into their own group apart from the rest of the department when it came to bonus calculations and the costs of her father's consultancy fees, and the costs of the labor board arbitration were budgeted there, meaning that they were constantly over budget and thus ineligible for bonuses for several years, which was a decent percentage of the incentives at that company, making at least one of them quit. My friend also said that her father usually met any management complaints with a big crap-eating grin and said, what are you going to do, fire me after that? <laughs> I really liked that one. I hope you guys did enjoy. Posted by user ForestCabin123K, titled, Bridezilla Karen ends up looking like a pauper at her own wedding. I, female 48, have known Pat, female 48, for decades. As far as I can remember, she was fixated on having five children and a picket fence dream life. 
I slowly cut ties with her in college because she was an opportunist and I didn't trust her. She is both manipulative and forceful. Her idea of cute rubs me the wrong way. Pat likes to walk like a penguin when she wants to elicit pity, and she usually does this when she wants to evoke the underdog narrative. I have never seen someone act so despicable and ridiculous at the same time. I moved on with my life, happily got rid of her for years. Pat eventually found me on Facebook. I accepted her friend request out of politeness. Pat has become the epitome of a permissive mother. Her five kids do as they please, and she never calls them out. She tried to force a relationship between me and her daughters, and made them call me auntie. Pat tried to drop them at my house uninvited. Her phone calls were insistent. She tried to monopolize my time, and she began to show up at my job. I created some boundaries, so she tried to find loopholes. It was a nightmare. My husband and I hosted a party for the community center, not the real name, and its new members. The community center is actually a very informal initiative, and my husband and I mainly serve the homeless population. We prefer to help strangers instead of catering to potentially narcissistic acquaintances. We don't mind lending a hand, but we have encountered truly dishonest choosing beggars. There are other services, like one of the members who helps women get their wedding and prom dresses for free. The community centre location, Headquarters, is actually a farm owned by an elderly couple. There is a barn, a venue, and a very nice green field with an artificial lake and some fowl. They charge us for the use of their facilities, weddings, etc., but not for community-oriented stuff. Pat had always been salty at her husband for demanding that she go back to work after baby number three. In the meantime, he worked three jobs. She demanded he get her pregnant to fulfill her dream of having five kids. He didn't agree because he was already nearly 45 and felt like he might never be able to retire. She got away with bringing new babies into this world anyway. Her fascination with being pregnant comes from all the attention she gets. She had at least one miscarriage in between each kid. Pat latched on to our group. She never missed any of our activities. I hated having her in my house, but it was an open invitation that included virtually everyone, and she was very active as an event organizer. I didn't like the way her kids behaved. We have a designated area for parties and entertainments, but her kids ended up inside my bedroom. We ended up having to keep watch of them and enjoyed zero of our own party. I called her days later to get my point across regarding their overall behavior, but she completely cut me off and began talking about herself and said her kids wanted to come visit again and use our pool. I never answered that. I didn't want to say no, I will not have your brats over. She also called me as summer was approaching specifically to let me know her middle daughter was bored and wanted to spend a week at our home. I politely declined citing that me and my husband have to work and cannot entertain guests. Pat paid no heed. Her kid called me on the weekend, calling me auntie, and attempted to coax me by saying, Mom says you invited me to spend summer with you. I quickly clarified and offered an explanation to avoid hurting a kid's self-esteem. Huh, <laughs> never mind. Her daughter just hung up on me. Pat's Facebook also showed some red flags, some cryptic rants here and there were visible, along with friends' comments and complaints on how she asked a particular person to watch her kids only for a couple of hours, and ended up leaving them all day. Another of her friends criticized her girls' night out, because Pat had just asked them to be patient and wait until she could pay back some money that she owed them, yet she had money to spend on Friday night outings. I thought that those very public comments on private matters were more like a cry of lost patience. Unpleasant things began to happen, like the time she volunteered to wrap the Christmas presents for underprivileged kids. We all wanted to create a mix of less costly gifts with really nice ones. Surprisingly, some nice and eye-catching toys and games were missing, but turned up under her Christmas tree courtesy of her mother-in-law's Facebook posts. No one could prove anything, but it was hate-inducing. Or, the time my daughter called me in tears to pick her up after she attended Pat's birthday party, Casey. 
My daughter had been ignored all night because she didn't gift her the expensive gaming stuff Casey practically demanded. My daughter did ask, but I said no. We would buy her a very nice and thoughtful present according to her taste. So, when I went to pick her up, my daughter was sitting alone in the living room while Casey and her friends stayed outside. Stories about Pat and her family multiplied. The owners at the farm, of the community center, decided to keep their gates locked until they had guests or events because Pat got in the habit of driving in whenever she pleased, and it was either her kids screaming and disturbing ongoing weddings, throwing rocks at the koi in the lake, or harassing the geese in the yard. Or how she stiffed another soccer mom with a lunch bill, and then pulled the struggling financially card. Or how other parents hated her because she created unnecessary hostile competition. When my daughter turned 13, I allowed her to wear my grandma's ring. It's not an expensive piece of jewelry, but it's vintage and girls nowadays want to look boho. My granny gave it to me when I became a teenager, so I passed it on to my kid so she could wear it on her birth week. It was weird that she became quiet and distracted after that. She also didn't want to go to school, and my husband and I became suspicious. She never opened up, and my kids had no clue. We went to her school, but her teachers assured us nothing had changed in her environment. My husband and I suspected she was being bullied, but our kid gave us no tools to support her. My kid is very sunny and very compassionate. She has never had any problems with other kids, so I called her best friend's mom. Natalie, my kid's BFF, told us what was going on. Casey, Pat's eldest, and my daughter had become close. I knew this and wasn't too thrilled. I found the age gap, Casey was 17, not exactly inappropriate, but I'd rather see my daughter spend time with friends in the same age range. Casey is very beautiful and a gifted student. She is also very conceited. To make this short, she asked my daughter if she could try on the ring and refused to give it back. She later claimed that she lost it, but would look for it, so my daughter was distraught. My daughter kept asking for her ring, and as a result, Casey shunned her and spread the word that my kid was trying to steal her ring. Some kids at school took Casey's side, so now Casey just wore my kid's jewelry to school like nothing happened. If that doesn't qualify as taunting, I don't know what does. My guilt comes from not being able to get my daughter to open up and feel safe telling me the truth. I talked to her and she burst into tears. I was both pained as a mother and furious that some teenage beer was doing this under our noses. I went straight to Pat's car after school. I asked to talk as Casey was about to go in. So I grabbed Casey's hand and asked to see her jewelry. Casey froze, and she tried to make a fist, so I became relentless. Casey yelled, Mom! And Pat struggled to get out of the car. I slid the ring off. Casey has tiny hands and wore the ring on her index finger. First, Pat yelled at me. After I confronted her with the engraving on the band, my grandma's maiden name, she argued that it was loaned to her daughter by my kid. Then she said she bought it. I paid no heed. I did warn them that I knew Casey had become an abusive friend to my daughter. Pat called me to tell me off. She said she was trying to raise an assertive young woman, and I had just messed that up by being overbearing. She never apologized for her thief of a child. Pat's husband, Hank, is what can be described as a doormat. Pat wore him down to a knob. He had no choice but to obey her to keep the peace. She was a bully who actively withdrew affection when he didn't follow her wishes, even in public. So she got kids number four and number five after a relentless campaign that included leaving him for two months. Her pregnancies were a nuisance because she expected to be treated like the only lady who has ever been pregnant. She strolled around in a wheelchair almost immediately after getting pregnant, and she would get very sick on weekends, so her kids were often sent to friends and family so that she could rest. Pat systemically bullied Hank. She would leave town and take the kids with her. Poor Hank would look distraught, drinking on his porch or just looking really lonely. This is how she got off the hook and was able to leave her job. Hank had virtually no voice, so he struggled to keep the marriage together. Everyone liked him, but hated her equally. 
Hank loved to talk to other people, but seemed concerned that Pat would be upset. Over time, according to my husband, Hank began to show signs of depression and mental distress. Our friend, Lena, runs the wedding and prom dress initiative. It's not complicated. Dresses are sourced from donations, eBay, trunk shows, etc. Unusually beautiful dresses are retained so that more than one bride gets to wear them. In some cases, a bride will pay 50 bucks, but most of the time, the dresses are donated to the bride. Pat was involved in this. Lena kept her in because they never had any issues, and her task was limited to just shipping the dresses out. Pat decided to renew her vows, and her bridezilla Karenzilla attitude became the icing on the cake. For starters, she bullied another couple into giving up their wedding date at the farm because she needed her renewal to match her exact wedding date. They were not impressed with her harassment, so they booked another venue. As a result, the farm owners were ticked because Pat was already costing them money after she had successfully negotiated a cut in their rate because she couldn't afford it, but will repay by doing maintenance work around the venue. She never made good on her word. Pat became attached to a particular dress that was already assigned to another bride. Lena made it clear that she would need to pay for her own dress. So Pat played it cool and shipped the wrong gown instead. She was adamant that it was the right dress, despite all the notes on Lena's agenda. The other bride was truly gracious about it. She was obviously disappointed, but she never made a scene. What bothered me the most is that I picked that dress and bought it for 40 bucks at a garage sale. Not my money, Lena's money. It was a vintage dress, ankle length, white with lots of lace, and a huge bargain. Again, when confronted, Pat did a Casey and used the this is mine strategy. We felt so bad for the other bride that we did our best to get her something nice to wear. The other bride was a true fighter, she had pulled out of welfare, earned her high school diploma, and was working on getting on her feet by trying to earn a certificate as an acrylic nail technician. So her reward was to have some Karen steal her dress? Pat never admitted to messing up, but just by the fact that she claimed it was her dress, we knew. Lena never allowed her in her warehouse again. Their last phone fight ended with Pat bringing up the other bride's past, like it mattered, and this conversation is over, it's my dress and you are mistaken. That was weeks before the other bride's wedding. Pat went all out on her wedding decor. She spent way too much. She hired a caterer for some food, mainly mimosas and appetizers, but the wedding invitation included a request for specific dishes for her Sunday brunch wedding. Either she ran out of banquet money or was on a complete moocher mode. I picture the penguin walking upon practically asking everyone to supply her wedding reception grub, and I cringe. There is nothing wrong with potluck weddings. In fact, they can be a nice addition to a very cozy and family-oriented wedding reception. But don't you need to at least be close to your guests in order to ask for such a thing? Even I got an invitation. I told everyone I wasn't going because I was very uncomfortable, being told what to bring, and was probably expected to give them a cash gift on top of that. Some of the older ladies in our group agreed. Some said they would not decline in advance because she's a bully and they didn't want a confrontation. Lena called me the night before Pat's re-wedding. Lena was there to close the Saturday night bingo, and Pat was awfully friendly, but that's what she does whenever things are going her way. Lena peeked into the garment bag and saw the exact same dress while Pat was caught up supervising the wedding decoration. The thing with Karens is that they expect everyone to suck it up or make their dreams come true, or they simply underestimate everyone and think we are all fools. Lena is a very straightforward person with a so sue me attitude. She told me that she would just ruin the dress. After all, it was hers, so she could do whatever she wanted. If Pat wanted to take legal action, and should things get ugly, she needed to prove ownership. However, the dress was the same. The marks inside the hem and the tags were the same. Even the tag numbers that were punched to identify each dress for logistics purposes matched. Pat had the dress altered. 
with some extra beading and dyed to a deep cream color. But it was obviously the same garment. Lena and I snuck in before the venue was closed for the night. All brides are allowed to stay in a small bedroom for a small charge so that they don't need to drive in on their wedding day. Honestly, the makeshift chapel was gorgeous. I don't know how she paid for it, but it was full of flowers and presumptuous details. I naively brought in some ink to spill on the dress, but Lena said she wanted something more awful, like a nasty surprise. Ink would be too obvious, and if she saw it ahead, she may be able to snag another gown from somewhere. No, the ideal thing was to have her trust the dress was fine, so Lena locked herself in a bathroom stall and completely cut out the back panel. She patiently put it back on its hanger and zipped the bag. We left through the emergency door with the back of the dress stuffed inside Lena's purse. I completely hate people who target and steal from anyone they, Pat and her kid, calculate to be in a weaker position. The wedding was scheduled at 9am. Pat called me at 7am, but I ignored her calls. I picked up by 8am, both curious and wondering if she suspected anything. Pat was frantic. She was crying that her dress was missing by half. I purposely made her explain, being annoyingly dense and continually interrupting like she does and stalling the conversation. She asked me if I could lend her my wedding dress. I said no, sorry. She then asked me if I would help her get a dress. I was satisfied to remind her that the town's bridal shops were closed on Sunday and the others that would be open were almost an hour away. The farm is already almost one hour away from our town. If Pat could get a shop to rent a dress, she would need to try the dress on and get it seamed. Even if the dress was ready to wear, it would easily take more than two hours round trip. She tried to ask me to go pick a dress. Who would pay for this? Even if a shop were open and I bought her a dress, it would add to the cost. Also, these shops were open at 10 or 9.30 at earliest. By the time they got to her, it would be time to wrap up the wedding because she needed to clear the venue by 12 o'clock for the next event. She broke down and mumbled some stupid stuff I didn't understand. So Pat hung up on me and called Lena instead. She asked Lena to bring her anything she had available. Lena and I ended up delivering the most outdated, moss-smelling, oversized dress. Pat's disappointment was a mix between angry and emotional. She also tried to wear her knee-length silk bridal slip as a wedding dress, but it was too obvious and it really looked cheap. She tried to get her daughter to give her her own dress to wear with an open back zipper, due to the fitting issues, but Casey refused, asking if she was supposed to attend the wedding naked. She's got a point, plus Casey is petite. The dress needed a petticoat to plump up the skirt, which wasn't available, so it dragged all over the floor and Pat had to keep pulling it up. Pat walked down the aisle with one hand on her bouquet and another one grabbing her dress. The dress looked limp and weird with the arrangements of pins, they didn't show, that caused the sleeves and neckline to pucker into messy rims. She spent the ceremony looking uncomfortable and out of place. Very few people attended, but that was not part of any revenge. That was just how people reacted to her entitled attitude. The dress looked awful. The reception portion of the wedding had all this princely decoration, a very nice cake, and a bridezilla with a dress from hell. I didn't stay, but I was told that she was so disappointed she spent her wedding sulking. There was no dance, no actual speech. She had to change into a shirt and leggings because the dress was too uncomfortable. Everyone talked about how Pat put on her flip-flops and walked around aimlessly, until she ordered the ushers to start folding up the chairs within one hour of the reception. So she practically kicked everyone out and the cake was never cut. Pat wasn't the same after this. She was not as loud and avoided everyone. I think she was disappointed that no one ran to her rescue not even her family, who came from out of town. Her husband finally cracked under all the pressure and sought some help. He was slaving away and coming home to clean the house while Pat used her kids as an excuse to spend like crazy. 
Hank also had to do his kids' homework because Pat never had time or never had patience. She also refused to get a part-time job so her kids could attend an after-school and get help with their school stuff. Therapy seemed to help Hank because the last time Pat left with her kids, he didn't seem distraught. He would be riding his bicycle and could be seen more relaxed while mowing his lawn. Hank told my husband that he had contemplated suicide after their third kid. When Pat returned, he maintained the routine, but was interested in going out by himself and doing things for himself. We began to see Pat alone all the time. Hank was seen less and less in the same car and eventually moved in with his parents. He filed for divorce on the grounds of emotional cruelty, and I don't think he won. Instead, I'm not sure of this because this is what I was told, there was some sort of a settlement or agreement that she would not get close or interact with him unless it has to do with the kids. I also don't know if Pat even actually suspected who or what happened to her dress. She slowly pulled away from the community center and became less active in social gatherings. Pat also removed me from her Facebook, as well as mostly everyone else from school and the center. Posted by user, The Leader Side. Titled, Mock My Mother's Death? <laughs> I bankrupt you. So this could be a very, very long story. I'll try to summarize where and when I can. My now ex-wife Kate and I moved into an apartment in 2010. The house as a whole was a renovated townhouse, split between two sides with two apartments on the bottom and two apartments upstairs addresses, ending in 126 to 128 accordingly. I wasn't the biggest fan of the apartment, as it was a much older building that I had ever lived in, but I quickly adjusted to the wood creaking throughout the night. On the initial walkthrough, we noticed that the only problem was that there was a dip in the bathroom ceiling. The landlord Jay promised us that he would get it fixed ASAP. One year to the day that we moved in, there was a loud crash at 4am. The bathroom ceiling had collapsed and there was tiling and wood all over the floor and in the bathtub. Now, Kate was typically the aggressive one, while I was more passive and laid back, and she kept calling Jay throughout the day. When she got in touch with him at around 9pm, she explained what had happened and insisted that it be fixed immediately. Jay rebuffed, yelling that his girlfriend was a lawyer and he didn't need to do anything. Now this is where I got mad. I went outside to have a cigarette and call him myself. I feigned a relaxed demeanor, and at first he began trying to talk to me as a bro, and kept saying, dude, I'm gonna get someone out there, but it's gonna take a few weeks. When he couldn't sway me that way, he began yelling about his girlfriend and her knowing the law. What he was unaware of was that I had read the tenant laws in my state, and so, as he tried to lie, I waited until he was finished and I then recited the law stating that if an apartment was considered uninhabitable, then the landlord needed to pay for the tenant to stay in a place until it was resolved, meaning he would have to pay for us to stay in a hotel of our choosing every night until the ceiling was fixed. He tried to say that our upstairs neighbor Phil was the super, but he wasn't sure if he could get him down there that night. He placed me on hold, then came back a few minutes later and said that Phil and his girlfriend were out of state, I rang Phil's doorbell and asked, with Jay on the speakerphone, if he was assigned as the super. He laughed and said, <laughs> no. Dejected, Jay said that he would have people out there the next day. Previously, he said that they were busy for at least three weeks. There is more to this incident, but it leads to two conclusions. One, if you're going to lie, then there has to be a consistency in your lie. And, make sure that the people you lie to don't communicate with each other. And two, this is where a feud started between me and my Kate versus him and his mother. She was the original landlord and gave the house to him so he could begin to make a side profit. Fast forward to a year later. Jay stopped coming to the house and his mum began doing the pickups. Around this time, my ex and I had been laid off and we were working with social security for food, health and housing insurance. We were approved for all three in April, but we would not get the check until May. When our typical check wasn't in the landlord's mailbox, he immediately gave a summons saying that he was taking us to court for eviction. The day we went to court, he had no lawyer and, 
Going before the judge, here is the summation, or rather, a non verbatim account of how the case went. Judge says, <clears throat> Does the defense have a means to pay within 90 days of non payment? And we say, Yes, Your Honor, and hand over the paperwork, showing that he will be reimbursed for April and May. Judge says, I see no problem. They are breaking no laws. Why are we here? And Jay says, Well, Your Honor, they have been bullying. Uh, I don't care. Unless they are breaking a law, then this case is dismissed. Suffice to say, Jay and his mother were not happy. Around this time in my life, things were tumultuous. My mother, who had been battling cancer for four and a half years, succumbed to it in June. This happened at roughly the same time his mum came knocking, looking for payment. I explained that I would leave the check in the mailbox when we got back from the funeral home, and to please just respect my right to mourn. She took her fingers and began rubbing them together, pretending to play the world's smallest violin. I will never forget what she said next. Oh, my mummy just died, woe is me. She probably had it coming. I don't care if your entire family is dead, I want my money. She smiled smugly, proud with what she had just said. I saw red, and my heart jumped into my throat. I went, grabbed the check, and handed it to her in absolute shock that anyone would say something so screwed up. She had finally managed to push a button that very few people I've known throughout my life have gotten close to pressing. I went into rage mode, but not in the way that you would expect. The revenge. We were always told that if a health inspector came by to not open the door. I waited until August, since that was the month before the lease was going to run out, and we knew that they would not extend a renewal. I walked up the block to the town hall to ask for a health inspection of our property. It was scheduled for several days later. Now, it's important to know several things. One, I was friends with all of the tenants. Phil had moved out with his fiancée, but the new tenant was a really cool girl around my age named Danny. Tom and Hannah on the other side of the downstairs floor had moved out in July, and Jay was still looking to fill it. The only one who wanted to stay out of this was Rose on the upper right apartment. Two, I had gotten permission and her spare key so I could let the inspector in Danny's apartment and I knew that I could use the back stairs on the right side to let him in on Tom's now vacant apartment. And three, I also knew that Danny was moving out in September, a month after Kate and myself. The inspector came and it was glorious. He checked the exterior of the house first, noting that wires were exposed, there was an old empty dryer, along with other odd clutter in the backyard. I brought him inside the shared entrance, and, as I was counting on, he noticed that the last inspection dated back to 1994, 18 years. This meant that for each year he did not have an inspection, there would be appropriate fines. For our apartment, we had black mold growing in our bathroom, and the bubble in the ceiling had begun to regrow to problematic proportions. Upstairs, Danny's apartment was suffering from leaks in the ceiling, and it looked like her bathroom ceiling was also on the brink of collapsing. We then went to the basement. The boiler was on the verge of exploding. There was flammable items, along with gasoline and a pack of matches, sitting right beside it. Two things that I did not know was... One, the fire door that separated the two sides did not close all the way, rendering it moot, and to be honest, I had never heard of a fire door until that day. And two, on the right, one to eight portion, basement side, there was a toilet. A toilet that had blown up. It had coated the surrounding walls, and the leakage prevented us going up to the floor via the right side. The entire time the inspector was photographing and writing constantly. We stepped outside and he said he needed to come back. When I asked why, he said he had run out of space to write down all of the infractions. He had filled the front and had written an entire page on the back portion. I kindly and coyly asked, well, how much will it cost right now? He scratched his head and said, hmm, around 20 to 30k from what I can see, but it's probably going to be higher, as this house was never licensed to be split into apartments. I thanked him, and he was going to come back with the county inspector. 
We were gone when that took place, though I did ask him to send me a copy with a list of violations to my new address. So we moved out at the end of August, but I got the updates from Rose. Because he was the current owner, he owed all current fines, and no one knew could move into the empty apartments until everything was up to code. Because three of the four were vacant, he was losing 4500 in potential rent. He handed the property back to his mother and had to file for bankruptcy. Now, here's the other thing. Every time an old tenant left and a new one was coming in, an inspection was supposed to be done. Now that all of the financial burden fell onto her, they looked into the records, and she was fined for each time that she had broken that rule, 750 per. By the end of the year, Rose had moved out, so that place was hemorrhaging money. I sat back, proud of what I had done, and left it be. Haha, <laughs> no, F that. I wasn't close to done yet. I felt like I had destroyed Jay, but my real target had always been his mum. I learned that she had eight properties throughout three towns in my county. I went to each one, spoke to the tenants, and said that I was a concerned tenant from another property, and asked if they had any problems in their apartments. Every person I asked described the apartment in very poor to intolerable levels, and that the mum was effectively a slumlord. She would ignore problems unless someone turned to litigations. She was threatened that they would summon the inspector, or, more often than not, the people would move out. She would refuse their deposit, and sink those into cosmetic repairs so that the apartment looked nicely furnished. People rarely fought back, because she knew that the occupants were upper lower class minorities. So, being the concerned person I was, I went to the inspector of the other two towns and asked for an inspection to be done with at least one tenant, if not more, and would be awaiting the inspector when they came. Turns out that she faced pretty much the same infractions on every apartment she owned. It turns out she actually had 12 apartments, but I initially only knew about the ones that fell within my county. The remaining properties in the next county over were given a mysterious heads up to perform a surprise inspection. From what I can tell, Jay's mum had been in the landlord business for about 35 to 40 years, and that collapsed quickly. Since we moved literally one block down the road from our old one, 54, I got to see Jay lose his primary source of income and have to claim bankruptcy, but also saw that his mother was also trying desperately to find a buyer for all of the apartments so she could pay off the fines. I learned two years later, in 2014, that she too had to file for bankruptcy. Jay and his mother camped out in front of our next apartment two days in October of 2013 before she filed for bankruptcy. I'm guessing that was to scream at me and or Kate. So I called the cops and said that there were strange people standing in a no parking zone and they kept looking up at the second floor. A cruiser swung by and told them to leave. I know I should have used the two months I spent monitoring everything to find a new job, but this was the one and only time I wanted to cripple a person where they hurt the most, their wallets. I think I got my point across. None of this would have happened if you were just fudging fixed the ceiling before it collapsed, Jay. Edit. I did some editing for clarification purposes, but I wanted to thank you all. I never expected to have anything I posted get anything other than a few hundred likes. I'm especially grateful for those that gifted me awards. Thank you so much. I wanted to clear up a few things that people have frequently left comments about. One. I was always taught to use wit versus physical confrontation. What she said to me was a sucker punch, and I was already in a state of shock from holding my mum's hand when she took her last breath, asked to write a eulogy, and create two memory boards. I was already on autopilot when she said what she did, and the way I reacted was more me disassociating than anything else. If it was after the ceremony, I may have punched her until she was unable to stand up, whereupon I would continue to pummel into her until someone pulled me off. She reminded me a lot of Professor Umbridge from Harry Potter, both in her mannerisms and attitude. Two, why did I not go outside when they camped in front of my new address? Well, two reasons. 
The first one being that the full brute of my revenge had not fully played out yet, and secondly, because I hoped that the cop would give her a ticket. If he did, it was a little bit less money she would have, and she would know that I was the one responsible. Three, did they know it was me? Yes, they did. I called Jay for the deposit back after the 90 days were over. You need to allot the landlord 90 days to pay you. I knew he wasn't going to, though. When we left, I went around every room and took photos of every angle. I also had a friend, Justin, who did the same with his camera. Like a good tenant should, I also asked for the inspector to take photographs to show that we had caused no significant damage. When Jay told me that we had messed up the walls and the wood was warped, I responded with, that's not what the inspector I called in said. He immediately hung up and blocked me. I lost the deposit, but it was still completely worth it. And four, on an unrelated note, and on the much more petty side, before I moved out, I would go to the front lawn where he had put the sign saying that there was an open apartment, Tom and Hannah's, and put down his phone number. Each night, I would use a marker to change the last two numbers. The modification was noticeable if you walked by during the day, but since I had the same marker and color, then if you were driving by, you couldn't really tell. Every few days, the sign would be replaced, and by the next morning, the modified number would be back. Even once we left, Jay was still not taking the whole cannot rent until building is up to code seriously, and so he was still putting up the signs. Since I was still in vengeance mode and I lived on the same block, I began to not only change the number, but I also began printing out signs that read, you do not want to live here, trust me. Signed, your friendly neighborhood tenant. That lasted until he took down the sign for good around November? Posted by user AE2AW, titled, Hippity hoppity, this is no longer your property to manage. After graduating college, my girlfriend and I moved to a new state where she was accepted into an engineering program. We found a lovely garden apartment style complex that advertised 100 megabyte per second internet speed, which was included in the price among a few other amenities. When we met the property manager, he seemed strict but well-mannered, nothing out of the ordinary until we signed the lease. The first problem. Suddenly, walking into his office was not allowed without an appointment. I had to come by to ask a question. I saw him browsing social media and figured he was as available as he made himself to us when we first came by, unannounced, to view a model apartment. Nope. He refused to answer my question and asked me to make an appointment via email. The second problem. The terms of our lease included an attachment to complete within 48 hours of accepting the keys that details all discrepancies within the unit. We submitted the attachment via email around the 40th hour. The property manager responded that the terms recently changed from 48 to 24 hours, and since we had passed 24 hours, we would be held liable for all found damages. When citing our copy of the lease, which explicitly stated 48 hours, he informs us that we signed an outdated copy and would need to make an appointment to come by the office and sign a new lease. The third problem. The internet speed was not 100 megabytes per second as advertised. It was less than 15 megabytes per second off peak and about five megabytes per second on peak. We again contacted the property manager to complain, but we were referred to make an appointment. The fourth problem, we made an appointment to address the previous three problems. During this meeting, and after I finished voicing our issues, the property manager leans forward and says, there are other communities in this neighborhood that may be more accepting of people like you and your girlfriend. You're welcome to break the lease and leave. People like you and your girlfriend. I had thought he was referencing our no-nonsense response to his nonsense. Daily communication, scheduling multiple meetings to address these issues, etc. But my girlfriend believed that he was speaking towards our skin colors. Her, a black woman, and myself, a white man. My girlfriend jokingly told me to check my privilege before getting serious and explaining to me that we were experiencing discrimination at the very least. The Solution 
I did some research and discovered the property manager worked for a larger organization that owned several complexes throughout the country. I found their director of human resources on LinkedIn and made a connection. I then emailed her copies of all email correspondence, screenshots of the lease, pictures of the internet speed flags advertised by the road, and more screenshots of online speed tests. We further noted this comment and the implications behind it. The human resources director replied within a few hours and promised us she would look into the issue. About two days later, the property manager called and asked us to come by his office at our convenience. We showed up near the end of the day and sat down across from him. He then proceeded to ask us if we would be willing to write a letter stating we accepted his apology, despite not yet offering said apology. And in return, he would credit us a month's rent, accept our damages attachment, and promise to have the ISP on site within a week to assess the internet issues. We declined. He got personal with us and revealed his job may be at stake and asked us to reconsider. My girlfriend leaned forward and said, There are other communities in this neighborhood that may be more accepting of people like you. You're welcome to leave. The property manager was replaced in a week with a super sweet older woman who not only gave us all the things the original property manager had promised, the one month credits, accepting the damages attachment, then further scheduling maintenance to fix said damages, having the ISPSS and upgrade the internet to promised speeds, but she also made it clear her office was always open for anything we may need. I looked up the old property manager about a few months ago on LinkedIn, still unemployed. Posted by user Mikey Audrey Myers, titled, Boyfriend cheats on me with my step-sibling, so I get him kicked out and destroy his relationship with his parents. Hi Reddit people, I've been wanting to post my story on here for absolutely ages, but I just never got around to doing it. So, then I figured, since I have a Reddit account now, I might as well post it. When I was around 17, I started dating a guy who was 19. I'll call him Jake for the sake of this post. Also, age of consent where I live is 16, so nothing illegal happening here. We got on well, spent a lot of time together, and cared for each other a lot. We even started talking about living together once we both moved out. We were a perfectly happy couple. Or so I thought. You see, after we'd been dating for a few months, something in Jake changed. He was getting a lot more distant. Whenever he was with me, he'd be checking his phone constantly. We stopped spending as much time together, and he started to get really funny about public affection, regarding things like hand-holding and stuff. He also seemed to start caring less and less about my feelings. I used to have a bit of a thing for humiliation in the bedroom, nothing too far, and we'd spoken about what Jake should and shouldn't say, but he started to get more and more degrading. He'd tell me how no one would ever love me and would pick on my insecurities. I actually broke down crying a few times when this happened. To give him a bit of credit, the first few times he did stop everything he was doing and apologize and cuddle with me until I felt better. But eventually that stopped too, and he just began rolling his eyes and telling me to grow up. He was like a completely different person. The insults started to seep into our everyday life. He'd pick on my appearance a lot, bring up my family, as I was dealing with a lot of family issues at the time, bring up the fact that I slept around before we started dating, a sort of rebellion caused by the family issues, etc. If I got upset by it, he'd just leave the room and let me cry by myself. I started to feel like it was my fault our relationship was falling apart. Maybe I just wasn't good enough for him. I knew deep down that he was cheating on me, and that was confirmed when I got a message from a guy, David, on Facebook, telling me that he'd been sleeping with Jake. He apologized profusely and told me that he broke things off with Jake as soon as he found out that he had a boyfriend. I couldn't be mad at David. It wasn't his fault. We spoke for hours, and I reassured David that it wasn't his fault and that he had done nothing wrong. David also helped me stop making excuses for Jake's attitude and the way that he'd been acting. He was a godsend. The thing that truly broke me happened not too long after the cheating was discovered. 
we'd been arguing a hell of a lot more. Then he decided to do something absolutely unforgivable. You see, I had a strained relationship with my father for years. He would cheat on my mother constantly, and eventually he settled down and had kids with a girl he'd been seeing behind her back. He did try to have some sort of relationship with me, till I was about 13, 14-ish, and then decided that he didn't love me as much as his other kids, and we stopped any and all contact. It broke me, and it still hurts to think about to this day. Anyway, Jake went out of his way to find one of my step-siblings online and slept with them. He bragged about it the next day, and my step-sibling actually posted online about what had happened, and I received a bunch of messages from their friends telling me how I had deserved it. This was probably the lowest point in my life, and I hated myself, partly for allowing it to happen, and partly because I had started to believe what they were saying. My only solace during this time was David. I didn't want to burden my friends with my problems, and David was one of the only people who knew firsthand what Jake was like. We spoke for a few weeks, and eventually, talk turned to revenge. I had tried calling things off a couple of months prior, due to Jake's awful behaviour, but he started with the apologies and telling me he didn't mean it, he'd never do it again. He even spoke to some of my family members who, unknowingly, pressured me to get back together with him as we were such a sweet couple. I hadn't wanted to tell them the real reason that we'd broken up, so I kept the details pretty vague, though I'm pretty sure some of them had seen my step-siblings post and knew why I didn't want to be with him. After weeks of talking and planning, I had finally had enough and decided to do something about it. My father wasn't exactly a rich man, but he worked a pretty well-paying job and earned enough money to live fairly comfortably. He had begun spreading rumours around when I was younger, during a custody battle with my mother, that he had set up a trust fund for me and there was enough money there to get me set up in my own place when I was 18, plus a bit extra. I knew that this was absolute bullcrap. He tried to get out of paying child support all the time. Of course he'd never set up a trust fund for me. However, Jake didn't. We had never spoken about it a lot, but he'd heard the rumours and i just always say what I told you folks. My father was an appalling parent who grudged paying my mother child support, so why the hell would he set up a trust fund? But Jake wouldn't listen. He even did his own research into the type of job my father worked and came up with an estimate of how much he thought my father was earning. Though to his credit, he did drop the subject whenever I asked him to. For a while anyways. I decided to use this to my advantage. Jake and I were still dating, though I avoided him at any chance I got. Until one night, where I sat him down and told him that since I'd be turning 18 in a couple of weeks, I'd started thinking about us getting our own place, with the trust fund my father had set up for me. He immediately cheered up at this, and honestly, I think that night was the first time in months that he'd said anything nice to me when we weren't in public or with friends and family. This very nearly made me want to call the whole thing off, but I spoke with David later that night, and he reminded me that Jake would go back to his usual degrading attitude in no time. We started looking at flats, though Jake was kind enough to let me have the final say and handle the paperwork because how could he possibly go out and cheat on me if he had to sort out the paperwork for a flat? I was a little surprised by this to be very honest, as I had always thought that he'd want his name on the paperwork and everything, so that I couldn't kick him out. But by this point, he'd slept with my step-sibling, degraded me, smashed my self-confidence to pieces, and cheated on me regularly. I think by now, he thought that I wouldn't kick him out no matter what he did. Anyways... I started taking up extra shifts at my work to save enough money to actually move out. Not with Jake though, oh no. I was moving in with my friend Emma. We had both been thinking about moving out for a while anyways, and thought, why not just be roommates? We found a cute little one bedroom flat that was close to our college and work, and started getting stuff sorted to move in. I also didn't want to bring any trouble to my mother's door if Jake started kicking up a fuss. Emma had no issues with clawing the face off him if need be, and told me not to worry about him coming to our front door. 
Then came the next part of the plan. I waited till a week or so before Jake and I were supposedly moving into our own flat and stole his phone for a few minutes. He had stopped caring about leaving his phone unattended and would sometimes flat out brag about how lucky he was to be able to sleep with whoever he wanted and come home to a little tramp who would make him dinner. So that day when he went for a shower, he wasn't all too bothered about taking his phone with him. Perfect. I went onto his phone, deleted my number from his contacts, and changed the name of his MM's contact as mine. Pleased, I went to the kitchen, smashed one of the plates, it was my mother's but it was a cheap one from a local shop, and I did replace it as soon as possible. I left for work once everything was done. My mother had left for work a couple of hours prior so she was safe. I just needed a reason for him to get ticked off. And, oh boy, did he get ticked off. His first reaction was to text me, calling me all the disgusting names under the sun. Except, it wasn't me he texted, it was his mum. I texted her in advance and told her that I hoped she'd forgive me, but she had to see what her son was really like. She had never tried to defend him as much, as she just hadn't known quite how bad his behaviour was. She'd actually called him out a couple of times where he'd slipped up and been harsh with me when she was there. She went ape crap. I never found out exactly how their argument went, as she phoned him to scream at him and call him out for his crappy behaviour, finally seeing how horrible her son was. It didn't help that she had been sent screenshots of some of the times where he'd admitted to cheating. She was absolutely disgusted by her son's behaviour and phoned me to apologise on Jake's behalf. It wasn't her fault though. He's old enough to know how to act like a damn adult. He wound up telling his mum essentially that her opinion didn't matter, as he would be moving in with me anyways. Needless to say, when he called me on Facebook, after I deleted my number from his phone, I took some satisfaction in telling him that we weren't moving in together, that the trust fund wasn't real. I had already told him that in the past, he just refused to listen, and that I'd moved in with Emma. I was called all the tramps and beers under the sun. His voice sort of turned into white noise after a while. I told him we were over and hung up. Blocked him on everything. He had to run back to his mum and dad, his tail between his legs, and they took him back for a little while. Though after a bit, the arguments became too much and his parents kicked him out. He stayed with a couple of friends for a few months before he managed to get his own place. His parents, especially his mother, have not been the same with him since. I still talk to his mum on occasion. Lastly, David and I took the liberty of sending screenshots of Jake's abuse to as many people as he'd been hooking up with as possible. A couple of sleepless nights were spent trying to track people down on Facebook. Part of it was to get back at Jake, but most of it was just to make sure that none of them got roped into a full-on relationship with him and had to deal with all the crap I'd gone through. So there it is, my little story of pro-revenge. I know this is really long, so there's a TLDR below. I wasn't ever planning on posting my story, but I was scrolling through Facebook the other day, and one of Jake's new accounts popped up on my The People You May Know section. After talking with Emma about it, she suggested posting it here. I hope it fits in this subreddit. Bye! Posted by user Cinderella Cookie, titled, I recorded a co-worker loving himself at work for eating my chocolate. Before we get to that part, I need to clarify that yes, I have a video, but I would never post it or anything because I would get in trouble for it. And because it's a ridiculous story, it's up to you to believe it or not. Let's name everyone involved in this. John is my boyfriend, the designer. Jenny is me. I did mostly video. Sarah, another co-worker. She was the best photographer there. Mario, to say that he was useless is an understatement. He's the reason I'm writing this. Donna is the director's assistant, and Amy is the accountant. Years ago, I worked in a government institution where I live. It wasn't a good job. It was basically volunteer paid work that was an excuse to not give employees any security a real job would offer, but I accepted because I needed the money and I had just finished college. 
I used to work in the communication department with four other co-workers. One of them was my boyfriend, still together to this day. And the youngest one, Mario, was a guy who was still in high school and got his girlfriend pregnant. His mum worked in other government institution and she got him that job. That's one of the reasons the boss couldn't fire him. We had to make designs, take pictures, do video, post on social media, check on the press when they wanted an interview with one of our bosses, and many, many other things. Mario was supposed to know about some photography and design because he told us that that's what he was studying at school, but we later knew that he didn't attend school often, so he was very, very bad at almost everything, and we tried to show him how to do his work but he was really stubborn and lazy. He never learned completely how to do the basic work. He always had problems with many people. Not with us at the beginning because he acted polite. That changed later. He was disrespectful when taking pictures. He was late almost every day, and he used to post in social media about governments and fight with people who didn't agree with him. Sarah and John would talk to him about how working in a government institution, you couldn't do that. It's simply not okay. However, he never changed and told his mum that we were against him. Mario went to work around two to four hours a day. Usually John and Sarah would be the only ones to see him because they worked more hours than the rest of us, but he would stay in the office around one or two hours alone, or they would send him to take pictures for the same time. One day, he had to take pictures of some event practice. Everyone else was off the clock. It wasn't a big event, and he had been working there around a year by that time, so we thought that he could go by himself. The accountant had to go there, and decided to take him with her and one co-worker of hers in her car. He was late again, and that's why he couldn't go in one of the work cars. The accountant left her purse open in the space that's in the middle of the driver and the co-driver's seats, when they went back to the office, she noticed her wallet disappeared. She instantly knew that Mario had to be the one who took it. They began to search him and our office and found nothing. Somebody found the wallet under the vending machine. At first, we took his side because they admitted they never found anything and because it wasn't right to search in our office without anybody else there. Mostly because we had photography equipment that wasn't exactly cheap. However, when we knew how the wallet was found, and when we talked to him, we knew it was him. More money and stuff disappeared when he was there, but nobody could prove that he took them. The bosses didn't want to create a scandal, so they let it happen. Our office used to be the conference room, so it was attached to the kitchen, and the director had beverages there for visits. We could use the kitchen, but not touch those beverages. But Mario couldn't even get in there. Anyway, the sodas began to disappear, and the director's assistant complained to us. We said we didn't take them, and she wouldn't believe us. One day, John noticed that our door to the kitchen was broken, and that you could take the lock off easily. With a pencil, we used to find pencils without tips, he took it inside the mechanism, and the door opened. It took its time, but he proved that Mario was getting into the kitchen when nobody else was there. However... That didn't make a difference and nothing was done, not even talking to him. One day, John and me were on our way to work, but I didn't have breakfast, so we stopped at a store. I bought something to eat and a chocolate. I put it inside the fridge and forgot about it. The next day, I remembered it and went to check. It wasn't there, and I got mad. John and I checked the trash can, it was clean and empty and we just watched, and we found just little pieces of that chocolate. So we asked for a video camera that someone offered us before. It could record for long hours. I want to clarify at this point that we didn't take that decision of everything you're about to read just because of chocolate. The chocolate was the last straw. For like a year, we had to put up with our bosses scolding us because of him. He never wanted to learn how to do his job, and things were always disappearing, including personal things. The first day, Donna left money in one of her drawers, and left it slightly open so he could see the money. We put the camera in the other building that was in front of ours. We had big windows, 
floor to ceiling, and you could watch Donna's desk, the hallway, some lady's office, our door, and the director's office. The other building just had empty offices then, but had big curtains. That's why Mario couldn't see the camera. We went home that day and left the camera recording. The next day there was money, maybe because we left one bill equivalent to $5, and he knew we would know he took it. I checked the camera and watched him getting in the lady's office. I don't know what she did there. And he took some of the cookies from her office, but he looked suspicious. Again, with this we couldn't do much, so that night John found an old cell phone that could record for two hours. The next day, Donna left the $5 again, but now she left $1 bills and the same drawer slightly open. We placed the camera in the other building and John disguised his old cell phone with a binder and some sticky tape. That day, he got left alone for a little less than two hours and left. John and me had a car so we were in the mall close to there, just killing time and then we went back for the cell phone. Oh my god. John watched a little bit of the video before the battery died. He said he saw something weird, but wasn't sure, because the screen was very damaged and we were in the car. I was driving. When we got in John's house, we could watch everything he had done inside our office. Not the other camera, because the building was closed and we didn't have access to it until the next day. First, we saw him getting in the office, watching some YouTube, everything normal. Then he went out, and when he came back, we saw him putting something in his pocket, but it wasn't clear what. Then we saw how easily he took a pencil, opened the kitchen door, and took something like a yogurt, then he closed the door. Then we could hear that he was watching something like a channel that's very famous in our country. But then, we heard noises. Yeah, those kinds of noises. We were supposed to have blocked those kind of videos and websites. I mean... Those were government offices, and the IT team had checked recently everything. But somehow, some way, he was watching porn on the computer that I used to work. And if you're thinking he did what you were thinking, the answer is yes. Thank god the cell phone didn't record his hands, but you could see his shoulders moving and him licking his finger. I know, very disgusting. Well, he ended and didn't even wash his hands. I was so shocked and disgusted when I saw that, that I wanted to cry. The next day, the first thing I did was to call the IT department to clean the computer. We didn't say why because of obvious reasons. John took the camera, and we could watch him when he went out of the office and checked carefully if somebody was around. Then he went to Donna's desk and took one dollar. He went inside the woman's office and took something but we couldn't see what. Then he went into our office. We called Donna to our office, and she was shocked. Then Sarah watched the video as soon as she got there. Then the director arrived, and we asked him and Amy to go to our office. We showed them the video. The director was very young and trusted us a lot, so he didn't hold his laughter when the self-love pat began. Amy was a young and delicate woman, so she just turned around and covered her eyes while letting a small scream out. We finally get the proof we needed to fire him. When he got to work, they didn't let him in. I don't know how the conversations went, but I know some of the words exchanged. Amy says, You stole again and we told you, and last time we told you it was your last chance. Mario, raising his voice, says, I didn't do anything. You're always blaming me. We have proof. You don't have anything. All of you hate me. Don't make me show you. Ah oh, well, show me then. Amy called our office and says, John, could you bring the videos? John, the first one, the video camera one, or the second one, the cell phone one, the second one. When he heard that, he was defeated and very nervous. John took his time downloading the video into the computer because it was in mine and he went to the office that Amy was talking to Mario in. John told me he was about to show him the video, and then he asked Mario, Mario, do you really want to watch this video? Mario couldn't even look John in the eyes and says, No, I don't want to. Amy says, Play at least the first video for him. And John says, I don't have that one, let me go look for it. I admit that I just wanted to see Mario's face. 
So I went to that office to give them a USB, but he didn't really watch me. Amy says to John and I, Okay, thank you, that's going to be all. And we left the office. We know she said something like, after playing the video, You always said that it was us and even told your mum that we wanted to get you in trouble all the time. You even told really bad things about this place. You are fired and we don't ever want to hear about you complaining to anybody else in the central or we're going to show these two videos to your mum. And he just left. Then we heard that he actually told lies to his mum, like, they hated me and told lies to make them fire me. But no one ever told his mum, not that I know. Well, this story made me realise that someone could be recording me anywhere I go. I mean, even I did it to someone. Posted by user Not a Bad Guy 3. Titled Ruined a Crap Housemate's Life. So I moved into a four bedroom uni house. I knew two of my housemates. Let's call them Abby and Ben. Due to unfortunate circumstances, our previously planned housemate didn't live with us, so we found a new one. Chloe. Chloe is a horrible housemate. This becomes apparent when they never paid any bills or rent on time, smoked like a chimney inside, against our agreement, leaves home for a few days, leaving a big pile of washing up for us to do, including our pots and pans. Scream gaming on their laptop all the way till 5am, walls are thin, just to name a few things. Basically, they suck. So it gets till about four months in. We cannot stand Chloe. So we have a house meeting. Basically, we sit there and try to explain how we would prefer they don't scream at their laptop, I'm assuming gaming, until 5am every night, as all of us get up early. Everything we bring up, Chloe denied it. We have each lent Chloe a month's rent and bills too, and Chloe hasn't paid any of us back, over a grand between us. Chloe denied it, saying, I don't owe you. This point, me, Ben, and Abby are all pretty ticked. Then a few weeks later was a Saturday night, and being students, Abby and Ben and me invited friends round for pre-drinks. We asked Chloe first, and they said they would be out, so that's fine. Turns out they finished work early, so they came home and were shocked to find people there, and went up to their room. They kept coming down and turning the music down. It wasn't even loud in the first place. Chloe got so angry and threw my speaker out the window. I didn't see Chloe do it, but loads of people told me so. I had had enough. I went to go get my speaker, and Chloe came with me to my surprise. And as Chloe left, in full visibility of me, keyed my car parked on the driveway. I got up with my speaker and shouted at her as she walked off. Luckily, we have an automatic light on the side of the house, and a car was driving down my road at the time, and the driver said they had a dash cam and probably caught it out the window to me. I stopped shouting in disbelief and gave him my email address, and went about my night enjoying the party. When it was time to leave, a lot of us hadn't finished our alcohol, so left it on the kitchen table and left. When we got back the next day and had sobered up in the morning, we found all the alcohol had been taken, along with the speaker, some headphones, and my laptop. Now I was really pissed. The revenge. I logged into my housemate's laptop on my email. This guy had pulled through sent me a small clip of Chloe keying the car, along with several close-up stills showing the key in contact. I first confronted Chloe asking if they knew where my stuff was, while Abby and Ben secretly recorded on their phones. Things got heated, and they looked like they were going to fight me. I'm a big guy, six foot four, and I'm really not scared. I'm basically just pissing Chloe off. Chloe then swung her fists at me a few times, making contact. I didn't fight back. I put my hands and arms over my head and face. Chloe then stomps off, thinking that she won. Let me remind you, Abby and Ben were recording. I call the police. They show up. I basically say I have good reason to believe Chloe stole my alcohol and other possessions. They go up and knock on Chloe's door and she says, 
go away. They can't go in without a search warrant. So I file a report about assaults and the things stolen relating the two. The police are very nice and basically tell me how to fill it in. They come back the next day with a warrant for Chloe's arrest for assault and battery. They then search her room and find all the stolen alcohol bottles, my headphones, which clearly were mine as they only paired with my phone, and my laptop and damaged speaker. I sued Chloe and won. I had indisputable evidence along with witnesses for all the events. I got around $3,000 for car, speaker, and rent Chloe owed us, and an additional $5,000. Chloe went to prison for resisting arrest, assaulting a police officer, assault, destruction of property, theft, and battery. Chloe still had to pay rent for her room, which we used as a gym. Posted by user Mediocre Fisherman, titled... Wasted a scammer's afternoon and gas money using a fake Facebook account for insulting me weeks earlier. Back in September, I went to look at a pair of moose antlers on Facebook Marketplace that my dad was interested in. He lives in a small cabin on my property and thought the antlers would look cool over his front door. We get there, and the dude is clearly high on coke. Jittery. Keeps wiping his nose, etc. We met him at a storage rental place, so he had to let us in with his code, and we were stuck in the facility until he let us back out. We get to his rental unit, and he gets the antlers out. They were very clearly fake. He'd said he'd spray-painted them brown to make them look like they were still in velvet. It was obvious he'd sprayed them to try to make them look real. The weight was off, the colour was off, there were several large cracks in them, and you could see they were white inside not bone coloured. There were also several points broken off, and the material inside was white and powdery, again, not bone. He kept insisting that they could be fixed with some epoxy. Finally, tapping your fingers on them made a drum noise, so they were hollow inside. At this point, I hadn't said a word at all. I was just along for the ride with my dad. Dad politely tells the guy that we're going to pass, he thinks they're fake, thanks but no thanks. This guy goes off the deep end, screaming at us, calling us all sorts of names, insulting us, our mothers, etc. Then he starts screaming at us that we were locked in there with him and we weren't leaving until he was ready to go. Dad and I get in the truck and luckily another customer was coming into their unit and we were able to get out of the locked gate when they came in. We both thought it was hilarious, how off the wall this guy acted and how fake the antlers looked in person. I stew on this for a few weeks and finally come up with a revenge plan. I didn't say a single word to the guy and he insulted my entire family tree, wife, intelligence, etc. I create a new Facebook account with the dumbest old person name that I could come up with. Then I use a bunch of Hide the Pain Harold photos to populate it with. Then start adding as many friends as I can, posting dumb crap about old black and white movies, my prostates, etc. Spent a few days crap loading this account as much as I could. Then, once the account was two weeks old and I could get on Facebook groups, I go to a few of the groups that I knew this guy was on and find some of the items that he had for sale. Luckily, he had two large bookcases for sale. Great, something big and awkward to move around. Next, I do some research and find the most pain in the ass location in my city to get to. I pick a place that has no highway on ramps, so it takes at least half an hour to get it off the highway. I message him, and I ask if he would deliver, since I only have a sedan, and he says yes. For 50 bucks to cover his gas and a helper, because they would take two people to move around. We set up a date and time, and I tell him I'm going to meet him at a nearby grocery store, since my house is hard to find. Finally, the time arrives, and he messages me that he's at the grocery store. Now I come up with every annoying old person slow thing I can think of, I'm putting shoes on. My wife is in the shower and I can't leave in case she slips. Then, oh, we've not gone anywhere in so long because of this China virus. My car battery is dead. 
Mr. Scammer finally asks for my address and says he will find the place. I get on Google Maps and find the most pain in the ass street to get to, knowing he's driving a full size van and towing a trailer with the bookshelves. So I find a street in the very center of an old, badly laid out neighborhood, got on Street View, and look for where the house numbers stop, and pick a number a few above that one. I test it in Google Maps, and Google Maps isn't smart enough to know that the house number doesn't exist. It just points you at the end of the dead end street. So, I relay this address. Of course, I make sure to mess it up a few times and get him lost in the process. After about 90 minutes, he messages that he can't find that house number, but he's on my street. Can I please come outside? I reply back with, no thanks. He says, no thanks what? I walked out there and saw them, not interested in buying. My Facebook account blows up for the next hour with him trying to call me, video chat, sending all kinds of horrible messages about how I'm a liar and a cheater. I never respond back. I check it occasionally, and about every two weeks he sends me a nasty message still. Dude had no idea who it was that messaged with him or why it happened. I'm kind of debating about doing it again. Posted by user MJD Little Nick, titled "Self Inflicted Petty Revenge?" Question mark. This happened in the late 80s, early 90s. I worked in an office that had a fair number of young secretaries. There were two secretaries named Bella. They were the same age and started at about the same time. One was very laid back and competent. She was also petite and slim. The other was very insecure and loved playing mean girls. Bella too hated that Bella One existed, and it was really like working in a high school. At some point into their employment, having two identically named people in an office that did not give secretaries last names became an issue. Bella too started campaigning to nickname Bella One Little Bella. Bella One didn't care, and Bella felt good for tagging her competition with a condescending nickname. Yes, you guessed the revenge and who got wounded. The office went with Little Bella, just fine, and promptly dubbed the second one, Big Bella. That was her name for at least the last three years I worked in that office. She just could not bully her way out of that nickname. Posted by user Rubik's Chaos, titled, Mother-in-law thought she paid for what she usually got. So I've been doing my boyfriend's mum's hair for probably a year or so now, and it's been going pretty well. I work for a corporate salon, and our prices are comparable for those around town, but we aren't cheap. Unlike other salons, our chemical services are a flat price, and we don't charge for extra colour mixed, or length, or density. This means everyone pays the same price for, say, an all-over colour, where at other salons, someone with thick hair would have to pay more. All of our services are technically supposed to be a la carte, so if you want a root retouch, highlights and haircuts, you are paying for all services. However, we are to charge at our discretion, so if we have someone who has very little hair and they're a good client, we will occasionally give a break. I had been doing a root retouch, 70 bucks on her, for most of the time, plus a haircut, 55 bucks and most of the time I was giving her free conditioning treatments, 10 bucks. Anytime I highlighted, I basically just charged her a full highlight, 145 bucks, and didn't charge her the additional 70 bucks for her root retouch. Sometimes I was even only charging her for a partial highlight, 125 bucks, even when I've done a full. So she's been getting almost 80 bucks off her services pretty much every time. Last time she came in, there was a hiccup in the babysitting schedule for my boyfriend's kids, and she had to bring them with for her appointment, which was fine, but I told her it would be a quick appointment. She stated that she felt like she didn't need all of her roots done, so I suggested just highlighting, to which she agreed. I told her it wouldn't cover all her grey, and she said, that's fine. That was almost three weeks ago. I get a text from her today saying, I think we missed a step. I have roots. I said no, 
We highlighted. And that's all we talked about. She replied that she thought she paid for what she usually got, 180 bucks. Her normal root retouch and cut is 125 bucks, and we definitely don't highlight every time. I offered a free root retouch to quell her, and she declined because she doesn't want to sit anymore. So she basically texted me to complain and stress me out, two days before Thanksgiving. My petty revenge? The next time she comes in, I'm going to explain our menu to her, explain all the discounts she has gotten, and from then on out, she will be paying for every service a la carte. Posted by user, Whiskey in Teacup. Titled, She keeps saying I'm fat like it's an insult. This one is nothing glamorous. So I'm 48 kilos, or 106 pounds, and 5 foot 1. I often tease the line between normal weight and underweight, yet every time my aunt sees me, she says, You're getting fat. Even before she says hello. She who got weight loss surgery to be functional, keeps telling me to lose some. My petty revenge? Every time she says I'm fat, I beam like a Christmas tree, squish my cheeks and squeal, Really? Thank you, auntie. I've been trying to. You should see her face then. It shrinks and pinches like she swallowed year-old cum. Oh... Posted by user Hunt the Wind 1971. Titled Pick a Fight So You Can Cheat? Enjoy Looking for a New Place to Live. Not sure if this is petty or pro, but here goes. I saw a post on another sub that reminded me of something that happened years ago and how I dealt with it. Back in the time before cell phones, I dated this girl. We'll call her Heather. After about six months of dating, she asked if she could move in with me. She was having issues with her parents, and they were kicking her out, and her brother's wife didn't want her living with them for some unknown reason. Things seemed to be going well for us, so I said sure, why not? For a while, things were great. After about a year of living together, I was having thoughts of marriage. I hadn't proposed yet, but it was on my mind. Then things started to change. We started arguing. She would start a fight and after a certain point in the argument, she would get pissed and leave. She'd tell me that she was going to her brother Steve's house. She'd come back the next day and things would be smooth again for a while. The third time she did this, I was a little more pissed than usual and went to the bar that we frequented fairly regularly for a drink. I belly up to the bar, and guess who I bumped into? Steve. He acted a little standoffish, but that was his usual treatment towards me, so I thought nothing of it. He leaves the bar, and I turn around to ask him about Heather, but I didn't get past, hey, Steve, before I saw her across the way. She was sitting cowboy on some guy's lap with her tongue halfway down his throat. I have to admit, I saw red... Dave the bartender saw the look on my face and was like, Man, I'd figured you'd be over her by now. She's been seeing that guy for months now. We're living together, I told him, to which his only reply was, Ouch. Sorry, man. Before tending to another patron. There were several things I wanted to do, but I thought better of it. I waved a bye to Dave, left my drink on the counter, and headed home. On my way home, I swung by Scotty's, a local hardware store akin to Home Depot or Lowe's, and they were closing shop, but I told them I'd only be a minute. The kind lady told me to make it quick, and I was back on the road in less than 10 minutes. Pulling up to the house, I half expected Heather to be there and prepared myself for the drama, but nope. So I pulled my bike into the garage and got to work. I installed the new door locks and began packing her things in trash bags. I placed the bags in a nice neat row along the porch, all the while expecting to hear Heather coming up the drive. But no. Spent a little time writing a note to place on the door and then went to bed. The next morning I wake up and the bags are still there and the note is still taped to the door. 
I figured old Steve hadn't said anything to his sister about seeing me at the bar, and that she'd be home any time now, thinking nothing was amiss. Around noon, my assumptions are proven correct when I hear her at the door. What the F is this? And she starts screaming at me to open the door. I open the door, said, read the note, and shut the door as she was asking, what note? There was some crying and pleading, but I was done. I had nothing more to say to her, and I surely didn't want to hear anything she had to say. When it got quiet, I pulled the curtain aside to see her stuffing the garbage bags into her car. The note? Bumped into Steve at the bar. Hope you have fun with that guy last night. We're done. Good luck finding a new place to live. Posted by user Steve with Clow. Titled, Disrupt My Classes? I'll Disrupt Your Sleep. So this morning when I was in my online classes, my mum and her boyfriend were smoking weed. When they get high, they are loud as F. I couldn't hear my teacher over them talking, so I messaged my mum asking her to quiet down. She texted me back saying, lol, no way. She kept being loud for another hour or so. Later today, while she was asleep, I went into the kitchen, got a bag of chips, and sat outside her room chewing them as loud as I could and ruffling through the bag. She woke up and told me to shut up, and I just told her, lol, no way.